evening, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Great. All right. All right. Good. Good. All right, before my guest speaker takes over with the passage, I'm going to give a little background on who James was. Now, it's widely accepted that James was the half-brother of Jesus. Does anybody here have siblings? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Me too. So, I'm sure most of you probably know about sibling rivalry. <laughs> now, this is something that's very common in any family that has any more than one child. It's basically a consequence of the children wanting the attention. They want the, the focus to be on them. They want to be the favorite. But most of all, they want to be better than their brothers and sisters. Now, as I'm reading this, I kind of had this feeling that this was an issue for James and Jesus. I mean, think about it. Worst, worst case scenario, James walks into the house holding a scroll high in the air. Mom, Mom, look, I got an A on my methods of biblical preaching and teaching class today. <laughs> and then Jesus walks in. What would you do today, Jesus? Oh, I, you know, I uh, killed a few lepers. <laughs> Took a stroll across the seat today. That was fun. Oh, and that's right. I saved everybody. There is no competition with Jesus. Is your <laughs> Which, in my opinion, might explain why he wasn't a believer that he was the Messiah during his lifetime. It wasn't until after Jesus was killed and resurrected that he became a follower. Um, a little bit of history, we, we know, or at least we speculate, that the epistles of James was written between 45 and 48 AD. The reason we know this is because 49 AD, the council in Jerusalem was headed up by James, Paul, and Peter. Now, there's a lot of information about bringing the Gentiles into the teachings that was brought up and considered, which would have been mentioned in James, had it been done before that time. So we can speculate it was done between 45 and 48 AD. Um, with this in mind, we're going to go ahead and let Fabia take it from here. Good evening. Scripture reading, James chapter 2, verses 18 through 26. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what, for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Beautiful, thank you. If you're wondering why I chose Bobby to read, I think her accent makes it sound more spiritual. So I added that to the kitchen. We're going to break this down verse by verse together. But um, as you'll see, there are some fill in the blanks on the papers that I handed you. Um, so please work along and let's start. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now, right here, James is offering a hypothetical conversation taking place between two men to the Jewish listeners. These are Jewish believers that are listening to him speak. Uh, I found it interesting that it begins with but. It's a conjunction that lets you know that he's going to be contrasting the two men in this scenario. Now, the first person is speaking, saying that I have faith that is evident through my deeds. Now, the man who's listening says he has faith. He proclaims it, but his actions aren't lining up with it. So I believe that the goal of James here is to say that head knowledge of God does not produce the fruit of good deeds. Uh, verse 19. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. See, it doesn't sound as good coming from me as it does from Bob. Um, to me, this is actually a very intimidating sentence. James is basically saying that we can study the Bible. We can memorize scripture. We can actually get up to the pulpit and preach to the masses about God. But if our lives don't reflect our teachings, if our actions don't reflect the words that we speak, we're no better than the demons. The demons know there's a God. They believe that there's a God, but that doesn't change their actions or their thoughts. They're still evil. So this is pretty heavy to me that God, or James, is comparing us 
to demons if you only have faith. And that's pretty serious. That it's half faith. It's not whole faith. It's not true faith. Verse 20, you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now right here, James is referring to Abraham as our father. So he is identifying who his listeners are. They are of Jewish descent. Now he's also acknowledging that he himself is of Jewish descent. That he's acknowledging that Abraham is our father. Now Abraham, uh, he was the first Hebrew, literally the father of the Hebrew nation. Now when he was very old in age, God came to him and said that I will give you an heir. I will give you a son. Now if you want to open up, you can turn to Genesis 15 verses 5 through 6. Just give me a couple of amens and raise your hands when you get there. Genesis 15 verses 5 through 6. Amen. 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 Nice. Amen. Nice. Good. All right. Look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to him, You shall, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, what's funny is he believed him, but as time passed, his faith began to waver. He began to doubt. And at this point, his wife says something he probably shouldn't have listened to. He takes the advice of Sarai and chooses to take on Hagar, her Egyptian servant, and she conceives a child who became Ishmael. Now, this isn't unusual for Abraham, or Abram as he's known here. He repeatedly proclaims to have faith. He does have faith in God. But as time passes, as the different obstacles come his way, he wavers. He fails the test of his faith because his actions don't line up with what he is saying. So, as I'm reading this, I realize that it's, it's actually a good thing that he failed repeatedly. Because it gives God an opportunity to come through as being faithful. Amen. What I'm realizing is that we never have faith in God first. God always has faith in us. He proves that he is faithful repeatedly. And then we have the blessing of having hindsight. We can look back on our lives and see the pinpoint moments where God was working. We know he was there. And sometimes in our lives, we see God working in other people's lives by looking back, and something clicks. We make that choice to have faith in God, which is where we bring up with Abraham willingness to sacrifice his son on the altar. That only led up to that point of having so many moments in his past where God came through. Verse 22, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. I want to be called God's friend. How about you guys? Anybody else? Yeah, that would be a nice little title, God's friend. I mean, I'm getting on the VIP list with that title. I'm God's friend. So... We see that in this section, that faith and his actions were working together. Now, his is the pronoun that obviously represents Abraham. Abraham's faith and Abraham's actions were working together. Um, the key word, though, in this passage to me is the conjunction and. Because it's not faith alone, and it's not actions alone. It's faith and actions. It's a combination of the two. James actually puts faith and actions on the same level. They are equal of importance. Faith without action is incomplete. It's not whole. It's, it's not finished. One without the other is useless. Verse 24, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Here we have James affirming that to be considered righteous, we will be judged by our actions and faith. Now, James also uses some important words here, that a person is considered righteous. A person is a very umbrella term. That means all of us have the ability to be considered righteous if our faith in God and our actions line up with one another. That means that we're not single out, we're not excluded. We all had the same opportunity. See, righteousness 
is available to all that have faith in God and their actions support that faith. The problem here, though, is that you can take that too far. I'm sure all of us know that person or even have been that person where you continue to live in sin. You continue doing what you want to do, using your body however you want, and then when somebody tries to hold you accountable, your first reaction is, well, I have faith in God, and God has grace on me. He knows my heart. And we have a ton of these little cliches that we can throw out at any given moment to deflect that accountability. But the truth is, is that our lives should be a tribute to what we believe without having to speak a word. Um, in the next verse, we see that in the same way, it was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodgings to the spies and sent them off in different directions. Now, to begin, we see that James is using a comparison between Abraham and Rahab. Now, th to me, this is equivalent to somebody taking the President of the United States, not necessarily Obama, sorry, Obama, but taking the President of the United States and comparing him to somebody who lives on the streets. You're comparing Abraham with a prostitute. That is a, a night walker, the, the whole, that's who she was. She was not a strong moral character. And he is comparing her to Abraham. So, the important thing here is that faith and righteousness do not depend on our social status. Thank you, Jesus. It is not where you're from, who your parents are, what you know, or who you know that affects your righteousness. It is your faith in God and your actions that are proof of your faith in God that provide righteousness for us. So, I'm going to give you a little background on who uh, Rahab was. Uh, we're going to be turning to Joshua, verse 2, 8 through 11. Now, I want everybody to go Pentecostal on me right now. I want to hear some big amen. So I want to hear <laughs> preach your brother, amen. something. Amen. Amen. Is that an amen? amen. The teaching amen. one is this one. That's good. <laughs> That's Joshua good. what? Joshua uh, 2, verses 8 through 11. Amen. 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 All right, we're good. <laughs> Before the spies laid down for the night, she went on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, for when you came out of Egypt, and when you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven, above and on earth below. Now Rahab declares her faith here very obviously. She says that I know that the Lord has given you this land. She's not questioning. There's no doubt in that statement. She's saying, I know. I believe that God has given you this land. We also say uh, in the very end of the passage, for the Lord your God is in heaven above and on earth below. Again, this isn't speculation. This is a woman's true faith and beliefs coming out through her words. Um, which, ironically, she never experienced any of this. This is all things that she has heard. This respect and this faith comes from hearsay. I mean, that's amazing to me. This isn't even like a true encounter with God like Abraham had. He literally talked and spent time with God one-on-one. -on -one. This woman is just nearly hearing about God and having a faith in him. That's how powerful it is. Again, God's faithfulness, again, just like we saw with Abraham, it's not about Rahab's faith in God. It's God's faith for the Hebrews has preceded him. God's faith has provided the faith for Rahab. She didn't come up with it on her own. It's a consequence of God's faith. So, we see that Rahab committed treason. She betrayed her country, her king. She lied, risked her own life and her family's life to protect these two spies. I mean, that right there is an action. That is a deed that reflects her faith in God. In verse 26, we see, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So far, we've looked at Abraham, we've looked at Rahab, and we've seen examples of faith going the distance, faith being completed. That you see faith, and then you see the action. 
Now, what happens when you separate the two? Well, Abraham was going to murder his son. That's simple. Take faith out of the equation, you have murder. That's what he was going to do. And then Rahab, what does she do? Her faith says that, oh, well, she protected these spies for faith in God. You remove that faith, she committed treason and betrayed her family, her friends, and her kin. Separate, those actions are evil. They have to be combined. They have to be in one because separate, they're useless. Now, in the same way, imagine Abraham says, yes, Lord, I will sacrifice my son. I'll do it. And then when it's time for it, he takes him to a ball game. It's, it's useless. It doesn't mean anything. The words don't matter. It's the following action. It's the preceding action. It's the consequences of that faith that matter. Same thing with Rahab. Where would the nation be? And she said, you know, I believe in your God. I know God has given you this land. And then she turned the spies into the guards. <laughs> Separate actions and faith are useless. They're dead. The Christian life begins with faith and ends with action. <clears throat> so with my time almost up I'm in the yellow here um, I have a couple questions for everybody uh, actually I don't want you guys to read this let me see the part mm -hmm. um, first if Christianity was outlawed in 10 years say Christianity is outlawed and you get arrested would the courts have enough evidence to prove that you're guilty do your actions speak for themselves? The second question is, as you look back on your life, can you pinpoint specific moments where you saw God's faithfulness that persuaded you to have faith in God yourself? It's always important to look back. It's why we are who we are today. And then my third question is, where do you stand in relationship with Jesus? Now, it's very easy for me to assume that everybody here is a believer, that we're all saved and we all put this up into action already, having faith and the actions that preceded. As far as people listening, I don't know in YouTube land, but I don't want to just assume. I don't want to just assume that you're all saved, and I don't want to just take that chance. So I would like us to, as a group, read this prayer together. Even if it doesn't apply to you, we're going to read in support of the person it does apply to. Okay, so we'll read it together, and we'll finish up with prayer. God, God I, I recognize, recognize that I have not lived, lived my life for you up until, until now. I have been living for myself, myself, and that is wrong. I need I you in my life. I want you in my life. I acknowledge the completed work of your Son, Jesus Christ, in giving his life for me at the cross of Calvary. And I long to receive the forgiveness you have made freely available to me through this sacrifice. Come into my life now, Lord. Take up residence in my heart. Be my King, my Lord, and my Savior. From this day forward, I will no longer be controlled by sin or the desire to please myself, but I will follow you all the days of my life. Those days are in your hands. I ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. That's beautiful. Amen. As we're finishing up, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a little prayer. Um, I personally have family members who aren't believers, and there's people I know that are in my lives who say that they are, but I know their actions are lining up with that statement of faith. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into prayer and finish up. Father, I pray for a renewing of our minds. God, I pray that the words that I spoke today were not mine but yours that you use the teachings that we are covering today in class to reach somebody's heart. God, if it's one person, that's all we need. One more in the army of your kingdom. God, we love you. And I pray that our actions, our lives, are living tribute to our faith in you. God, we pray all of this in your son's name, in your son's healing and forgiving name. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah.